Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so, the joyful, the faithful, the peaceful, we welcome you. The doubters, the ragged, the sinners, we welcome you. The put together, the winners, the known, we welcome you. The wounded, the battered, the breathless, we welcome you. Those who are saints and those who ain't, we welcome you, just like Jesus. Amen. We're going to see today, uh, when we get to our passage that we're studying, that it's not the intensity of our faith, it's not the, the uh, magnitude of our works, it's the object of our faith, and it's the one who empowers us to do what's right that we rejoice in. It's Jesus himself. That's why we lift him high here today. And that's why we can extend our welcome to all types of people. No one is too far gone. No one is too far away. No one can outrun the grace of God. No one can outrun the mercy of God. And so we can extend a welcome to all in this space, believing that Jesus doesn't leave us where we are. He changes us. But what we're seeing in the book of Matthew, and we'll continue to see, that although transformation is part of the Christian life, that only happens after an encounter with Jesus. And so at the beginning of our walk with Jesus, and we could all testify to this, Jesus meets us where we are. And he meets us as we are. He doesn't leave us there, but that's where he meets us. And so that's why we can boldly welcome all people into this space and say, come and know Jesus and let him and the word of God transform us from the inside out. And that's our hope today. We're going to pray. Well, actually, let me tell you, that's the the point of our mission statement. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. That's exactly what we mean when we welcome you in the name of Jesus, when we say no one's too far gone for Jesus to meet them there. It's because we have experienced it and we're seeking to embody that redemption and renewal that is ours in Christ alone. We're going to pray. Before we do, we'll just take a few minutes to quiet our hearts. Again, this is just, there's nothing special about this in our, it's not like we're doing something special. We're just recognizing that sometimes we need to slow down and put the brakes on. We need to be better at listening. My mother-in-law, this morning, I was just talking about, somebody was like, oh, Best Buy, it was one of my sons, was like, Best Buy was closed at, closes at 8 p.m. on Saturday. Can you believe that? It's like, yeah, it, I mean, I get that that's shocking maybe nowadays, but that was always, when we were younger, that was the case, right? Like, and then stuff wouldn't be open on Sundays, and I'm not being a curmudgeon. But I am, my, my mother-in-law said, I, I miss those days, because it was like there was a chance to stop and restart, and it just doesn't feel like that's available to us in life anymore, those opportunities to stop and restart. And so one of the reasons we do this little bit of silence and one of the reasons we gather every Sunday is in a sense that's part of the rhythms we need as people. We stop. We realize we can't do this whole thing on our own, and we rely on Jesus. So in the silence, remember that. Prepare your hearts to receive what God has for you today. Father, reset us today. Restore us today and restore us today we got a lot of good things going on in our lives, and a lot of us probably have some things that we rather would not have going on in our lives. But all of it can be busy. All of it can be distracting. Even the best of things can sometimes take us to a place where we forget how, how desperately we need you and how near you draw to those who seek you. And so we come today seeking and we come today asking that you would remind us of both our desperation for you and the depth of your love for us. And that those two things meet in this space today, people desperate for your presence, realizing your presence, and that in that we're changed 
by your grace and mercy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Mercy Village Church. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Will you stand with us? If you're new with us, we are a participation church. We are a church plant, and we pray that we will always be that way, that this is not going to be a, a country club of any sort, but we, we do this together. We do the work of Christ together as family. We sing, we lift our voices, proclaim truth to one another together, and so we do this this morning. We're going to sing some songs uh, and, and we get the joy of the Lord with that and be reminded of what He has done for us, what God has done for us. We're going to read first this call to worship. There we go. Uh, let's read this together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us in, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's lift our voices and sing together. Have her. A thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Come on, church. You're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am and I've seen many searching for Far and wide, but I know that we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. can hardly think as you call me, and deeper still as you call me, and deeper still as you call me, and deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father to you. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, 
It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm in love by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Sing it again. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm in love by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Let's continue singing this hymn together. Church, every voice. And come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, and call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me some melodious sonnet, a song by faith. Tongues above the mountain, fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. And here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his Precious love. Think about these words. Hold to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering. Heart to thee, I'm prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. All else I adore. our prayer above all else I adore your name above all else and to my heart to sing your praise come on church sing it out above Take and seal it, seal it for thy 
courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Romans reminds us, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace by which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's because of Jesus that we can stand today and be heard by God Almighty. It's the perfect life and death and resurrection of the Son of God. That is why we're gathered today, because of what He has done for us. Our faith in Him, we, are, we receive the righteousness of Jesus, so we stand before God today, righteous because of Jesus, not because of us. We have nothing that we can give, nothing that we can offer. We fall short of the glory of God, but Jesus took our place and has given us his righteousness, and so we stand before a holy God today. Let's continue singing in that truth. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? darkness you see there's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free through death to life everlasting He passed and we follow Him there or sin no more had dominion for more than conquerors we are. Sing it out. And turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the thing The light of His glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, He promised. Believe Him and all. Come on, church. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the 
things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Come on, sing this out. Amazing grace and amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was alive, but now. A wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I was alive, but now. Thank you today for Jesus. Thank you for these timeless hymns that we can sing to you in 2024, God. With all the turmoil, the sin, and the strife that's around us, God, we can look to you. Help us to focus on you today, God. We are here today because we need more of you and less of us. And that's something only you can accommodate, that you can accomplish within us. God, we look to you today, to your word. Teach us truth. Draw us close to you as sons and daughters of the one true king. We are grateful that you've made yourself known to us and that you've grafted us into your family. God, we thank you that you have, you have a future for us with you forever. Speak to us today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's, uh, let's greet one another. Welcome one another. Kids are dismissed. We're going to take a second real quick to pray for some folks. And uh, we often will pray for our partners outside of the four walls of this church. Um, and we are thankful for those partnerships that we have. Uh, in fact, you can, uh, back by that world map, back to my right, to your left in that back corner, you can see all of our prayer cards for our partnerships that we have um, across the country and around the world. Uh, but we want to do better during this time to not forget uh, our own people and our own community. And so today we want to pray specifically, and it's a perfect time to do it because they just received all of uh, our ragged aggregation of souls, which are our children, uh, they just received them. We're going to pray for our kids ministry leaders, our kids ministry volunteers, our youth leaders, our youth volunteers, and for all the kids that are part of that program. I was really struck by, if you get a chance to see it back in the uh, first through fifth grade class back there, there's a banner up with the logo for the kids ministry on it, and then there's all these handprints of kids who have been served, loved on, met in a place with uh, the kids ministry back there and just the legacy that is forming already is just super here in our church with these kids as they grow and develop and so we're thankful for everyone 
um, who participates in that. So just join me as we pray for those leaders, those volunteers, and those kids. Father, thank you so much for the kids' ministry here at Mercy Village Church. Thank you for those who started it back when I thought uh, we're not even ready, but we were. I was wrong. And those who dedicated themselves to it were right because you were right and you were leading them. You were, were ushering them into it. And so thankful, we're deeply thankful for that ministry. We're thankful for the kids that are in there. We pray that you would grow them up in knowledge of Christ, knowledge of, of what it looks like to live in the presence of you and what it looks like to follow Jesus uh, with faithful lives. Pray for each of the volunteers that you will bless them in a special way. Thank you for their um, hours and and time that they put into that. Sometimes a thankless job. Um, I pray that you will affirm the work of their hands there. I thank you for the leaders who put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears behind the scene as well. I pray that they will know, by your good grace, you'll make it obvious to them that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. Um, We thank you so much for all that you are doing through that ministry, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. By the way, I was supposed to do this on the front end. If you do want to volunteer for the (laughs) kids' ministry, talk to Brittany. Uh, We have some folks who are uh, pregnant. They're going to have to step out for a season. Uh, So even if it's just for a season, even if you're not even like, I want to do this permanently, but you just were like, I can can help weather this time when the volunteers uh, back there are lower, then let Brittany know. Wave your hand again. She's right here. Um, Talk to her if you want to help out. Sorry about that. Thanks. Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 16 and 17. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. Say with me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Thank you, Dan. We continue in the book of Matthew together. Today we're going to meet a man who was in middle management in the military, middle management guy, which got me thinking of uh, The Office, that classic sitcom. There was middle management there. Of course, Michael Scott was middle management, right? He had people above him who were reported to, but he also was over the office. But the funnier part is Dwight Schrute wanted to be middle management. So if you remember, he would refer to himself as the assistant regional manager. And then Michael Scott would always correct him. It's assistant to the regional manager. Big difference. We've had the word to in there. You're not the assistant regional manager. You're the, manager, you're the assistant to the regional manager. Anyway, if that show is not funny to you, then I'm sorry. I'll pray for you. But that's, no, I'm just, just kidding. But I got to thinking about that because this man who takes up the bulk of the scripture that we'll see today in verses 5 through 17 of Matthew chapter 8 was in fact a centurion. He was a military guy and he both had people in authority over him, but he wasn't a scrub. He also had a leadership position of his own um, and we will meet him today and see what Jesus does in his life. But he's not the only one in this passage whose life is impacted by Jesus. There are other lives that will will meet more people. We just read about some of them. There's actually this blanket statement at the end of the passage that there are many who were transformed by Jesus. And what we'll see through all of these encounters today is this, those transformed by Jesus sometimes, sometimes display commendable faith. The faith of the centurion today we'll see is commended. But all the more important than the levels of their faith is the object of their faith. Get that today. That's the main point. More important than the level of your faith, the intensity of your faith, the magnitude of your faith is the object of your faith. All sorts of people are changed in the gospel, but the change agent never changes. It's always, always Jesus. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, we meet the centurion first. He takes up the bulk of the verses today. Or this encounter that Jesus has with him takes up the bulk. 
when he, Jesus, had entered Capernaum, he's come down off the mountain from the Sermon on the Mount, and he's re-entering into Capernaum. Last week we learned about a, a meeting he had with a leper uh, who he healed, came to him, and, and Jesus healed him. Now we read of an encounter with a centurion. He came and he had entered, uh, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Now real quick, just to reset us in geography, because I think it's so important that we remember these are real stories about real people in real places. This isn't some fanciful Sunday school lesson. These are real accounts. And we talked a little bit last week about how every part of Scripture, some of its poetry, um, some of its metaphor, we have to respect the genre. So not every bit of it is like the way we perceive a history book today, that it's just dates and exact details. But the events described in Scripture are historical events. They truly happened in real life. And so that's a map of... Uh, the nation of Israel in the days of, of Jesus. And if you zoom in, you'll go up to the north where, where Galilee is. That little purple uh, circle there was a region, right? So you have the nation of Israel, then you have a region in the north called Galilee, and that little body of water in the center there, this the Sea of Galilee, and at the very top of it was a small town called Capernaum. A lot of what happens early in Matthew happens in that region and specifically in Capernaum. So geographically, that's, that's where we are. So he comes into Capernaum and there he meets a centurion. Now that word should sound familiar if you think of the word century, a hundred years, gives you a clue to what his title originally meant. His title originally meant a leader of 100 men. Now, likely by this time, the Roman government had not been that exact with it anymore, but he was, in fact, over a group of soldiers, probably in that range of 100 men, but maybe not exactly 100 men. This is who he is. He's literally middle management in the, mil in the military. He reports to some people, and some people report to him. But that's not derogatory, that's legit. If you've ever served in the military or you know someone who has, that as you, as you rank up in the military, right, unless you're just born with great connections, that requires hard work and effort and energy and commitment. So this is who this man is. Another thing to notice real quick, and I just want to spend time here for the sake of uh, honoring the integrity of Scripture, Matthew writes differently than the other authors in the Gospels. And if you're a careful reader of the Gospels, then when you read Matthew's account of this story and then read Luke's account of this story, there might be some things that make you think, well, uh, what? Why, is, why does Luke tell it differently than, than Matthew? Specifically this. Today we will, Matthew writes that the centurion brings this message to Jesus, but in Luke... There's religious leaders who come on behalf of the centurion. And then later, there's friends of the centurion who come on his behalf. And Luke, there's no mention of the centurion actually coming and, and speaking directly to Jesus. So what gives? That's a fair question. And, and, and the Bible is strong enough to handle your questions. And, and, and again, the more carefully you read the scriptures the more questions you'll sometimes have like that. I just want to remind us of a few things about Matthew. Matthew is condensing most of his narratives down to the, to the brass tacks. Like that's kind of his MO as you read through. There's not a whole lot of details. He just kind of puts it down. He gives a lot of his time to the teachings of Jesus. And he takes these narratives and kind of condenses them down. That's a, that's a um, literature, an, off, an authorial choice. He's the author. He's writing this out. He's divinely inspired. But if you, if you read the Word of God, you'll see that the way God divinely inspired these authors was to write through their own hand. That's why the styles of these books are different. And that's what makes Scripture so enjoyable and, and wonderful is all the different genres and all the different styles and all the different authors. Completely, 100% inspired by God, but inspired in such a way that it comes out in their unique personality, their unique way of writing, their unique experiences. Just like us in the church, we all serve the Lord, but uniquely with our giftings and our talents and the things that we're called to. The scriptures are the same. 
Matthew's also not concerned about exact chronological order. The events in Matthew are, are more topically arranged instead of chronologically arranged. We get uncomfortable with that because, again, it's America. We just, we have our calendars are to the hour, right? Like, you know, day one, this, this, Monday, Tuesday, we've got it all planned out. And, and so that makes us uncomfortable sometimes, but that's how he writes. He lumps them together more topically. And then uh, he's not always concerned with all the specific little details of every story. Again, I say that to comfort us, right, and answer big questions that we might have when we come to reading the Gospels. And we should have these questions, but there's good answers to them. So Luke tells us the religious leaders come on behalf and then the friends come on behalf. But the centurion never does in Luke. And we're obsessed with these precise details oftentimes. But in this example, we have to understand culturally, and it's true, we would understand this with an ambassador from our country. They go to another country and they speak on behalf of the president, they speak on behalf of the United States, and you would hear what they would say, and you would say, that's, you would never say, that's Ambassador John Smith's policy. You would say, that's America's policy. These are the policies of the president of the United States, even though he didn't speak them. Right? Like he, the ambassador spoke them. The ambassador presented them. So what's probably happening with Matthew is Matthew is leaning hard into that reality within culture that if, since these people are the ones who came and spoke on behalf of the centurion, it's him that's speaking. He's speaking because these are his words. Or perhaps the centurion shows up as the third party in the list of, of events. It could happen anyway. Just don't worry too much about it. The integrity of the scripture stands. The appeal of the centurion comes to Jesus, and that's the more important part. Here it is. He says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. We spent some time on this last week. We're not going to hash it out as in-depth this week, but notice again the approachability of Jesus and the willingness of Jesus. The centurion has strong faith. It'll be commended. He certainly does. He's courageous in the request that he makes. The leper last week was bold in his request as well. So certainly they had courage. Certainly they had boldness. But there was something about Jesus, the way that he lived, the way that he acted, that made people feel that they could approach him, that they could come into his presence and receive his power. Sometimes you've met powerful people in your life maybe that you don't feel like you can come into their presence. And maybe you've met people who you feel like you can come into their presence, but they don't have a whole lot of power. Jesus has all the power, and he invites us into his presence. Not only that, but he's willing. Last week he said, I will, to the leper. Remember, I will be clean. Today he says, I will come and heal him. Take me to your home, centurion, and I will heal him. But here's where the narrative takes an unexpected turn. You expect the satirian to be like, okay, let's ride. Let's do it. Let's go. But he doesn't. Instead, in verse 8, we read this. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He says, don't come. I'm not worthy for you to come into my home. Verse 9 he speaks to why he thinks that Jesus can heal with just his word, even from a distance. He says, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I'm middle management. I get this. I get how it works. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. He understands authority and how it works. But the authority that he attributes to Jesus shows that he's beginning to really understand who Jesus is because what he's insinuating in the words that he's saying, again, if you read carefully and pay attention, is he's insinuating that Jesus is at the top of the organizational chart. That's what he's saying. That he's at the very tip top of it. This man must have been convinced of this because, the, uh, because his illustration, which is plain and obvious, is preceded by a massive faith claim that Jesus can speak words and someone's body can be healed. That's massive, right? This flies in the face of the cultural beliefs of the day, by the way. We don't even believe in healing anymore. Uh, but they did then, but they believed that healing had to be through the touch 
of the person who was doing the healing. That's what the whole culture would have believed. This centurion flies in the face of that. He says, you've got so much power, so much authority, you don't even have to touch him. You speak the words and it'll be done. But more important, the centurion is saying, I'm over some people and under some people, but Jesus, you're above all the people. And not just all the people, but you're above disease. You're above human bodies. You're above sickness. You're above paralysis. You're above even the cells of the human body. You're over it all. And when you speak, the people and things that you speak to have no choice but to obey. Indy Wilson puts it like this. I'm not a fan of every single thing that he's put out. I shouldn't have to say that, though. That should just be, we should understand that in this church. We're going to quote people in here. We don't agree with everything they say. But this was good when he said this in notes from the Tilta world. He said, I look around the world and I ask myself, what is it made of? Here's his answer. Words. Magic words. This is fanciful. This is poetic. If you're not into the poetry, then sorry. The world is made of words, magic words spoken by the infinite. Words so potent, spoken by one so potent that they have weight and mass and flavor. They are real. They have taken on flesh and dwelt among us. They are us. In the Christian story, the material world came into existence at the point of speech. And that speech was ex nihilo, meaning from nothing. God did not look around for some cosmic goo to sculpt or another God to dice and recycle. He sang a song, composed a poem. You yourself, he continues, are spoken. I am am spoken. We stand on a spoken stage, the spinning kind, the round kind, the moist kind. Everyone's favorite word, moist. The kind of stage with beetles and laughter and babies and dirt and snow and fresh cut cedar. Then he goes even narrower. You are made of cells. I am made of cells. My cells are built on molecules. My molecules make use of atoms. My atoms are mostly space, but the bits that aren't are called quarks. Get this, my quarks, the tiniest discovered part of your human, of your uh, biology is standing because they're obedient. Do you believe that today? That it is the word of God that holds it together. They've been told by a voice they cannot disobey. He goes on, I'm real, I'm heavy, I'm matter. Cut me and I'll bleed, but I'm not made of anything. If the magician, the poet, the word, if the singer were to stop his voice, I would simply cease to be. That's the power of the authority of Jesus. John, the apostle, said it like this. In the beginning was the word. Jesus. In the Word, Jesus was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. The Apostle Paul takes it further. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. So far we've we've seen the same thing that John told us in his gospel, but then he adds this line, and in him all things hold together. Not only did his speech create everything, but it is his speaking that holds everything together. Here's the point. If Jesus never speaks, nothing you see around you would have ever existed. That that sounds like such a fairy tale, doesn't it? I mean, we can be honest, right? Like it kind of sounds like a fairy tale to us, but that's what the scriptures claim. And we're called to grow in our faith, to believe that it is literally the voice of Jesus that brought all of this into being. And not only that, but if you ever stopped speaking, if you ever stopped sustaining It would all cease to be. In a real sense, your heart is beating right now because the Savior sings. Because he keeps speaking. He keeps sustaining. 
See, we, we walk in here, we're not that desperate for Jesus. I'm not. I'm mean, going to be real, right? Like, oh, you're holding my whole being together. <laughs> like, it'll all just like, like the skin would, you know, like, what is it, the Avengers where he snaps and everybody turns? Like, that, that's kind of in my mind what I imagine, right? Like, if Jesus stops sustaining all of this, we just pff, be gone. We must be desperate for him. So this Gentile centurion who has no formal training in the things of God, has faith to believe that Jesus can speak transformation into reality. And Jesus recognizes this. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. This man gets it. We don't know how deeply he gets it. We don't know how sound his theology or his doctrine was, but we see that he had faith that Jesus had the authority to speak transformation into existence. He believed that about him. And Jesus says, I have not seen anything like that even here in Israel, which is kind of a point that he's trying to make. Verse 11, he says, I tell you, many will come from east and west to recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And what he means is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are the, the, the Jewish people are the descendants of them. That's, that's where everyone, his primary audience there in his ministry would have been Jewish people, the descendants of them. And he says, it's not just going to be those ethnically from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that sit at the table. There's going to be more from the east and the west. And the centurion testifies to that reality. He says, you see, that faith in him was not, get, was not like manifested out of his own self. That was placed into him by a God who has said from the beginning that his plan is global, to save people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And it's a good thing it is, right? Because if it wasn't that way, there wouldn't be any of us Appalachian knuckleheads in the kingdom. But we are, by God's grace. He's saying that this man is evidence of God's global plan. He goes on, though, with a heartbreaking counterpoint. He says, when the sons of the kingdom, he's referring to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, in that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's drawing attention to the reality that so many of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will miss the Messiah right in front of them. And that what we do with Jesus matters deeply. There's eternal consequences to what we do with Jesus. There's a real, literal, eternal punishment awaiting those who look at Jesus and say, no thanks, I'll do it my way. There are consequences to that. And they are eternal and they are devastating. Hell is the word used to describe that eternal separation from the presence of God so intense that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, not just for a day, but forever. Heartbreaking. Reality. But in the midst of there is also that silver lining of joy that includes us, Gentiles being brought into the kingdom of God. Jesus then turns to the centurion and he says, Go, let it be done as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Jesus just says, Let it be. And it is. That's his power. The physical properties of the centurion's servant are changed by the voice of Jesus. But watch what happens next. And I love that Matthew puts this story right up against the other one. Because there's just been this massive proclamation that now Gentiles are going to be welcomed into the kingdom and many descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to reject it. But almost as if to remind us, but not all of them will, he takes us to a Jewish home. Peter, his disciple, is married, and his wife's mother is very, very sick. That's where he goes next in verse 14. When Jesus entered Peter's house, the, the mother-in-law is very Appalachian. My mother-in-law lives at my home. I guess Peter was the same. His mother-in-law lived at his house, at least during this time, of sickness. She was lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand 
And the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. By the way, notice that she was certainly Jewish, but not only that, she was on the fringes of the inner circle of, of, of Jesus' life. Jesus loved his disciples to the end, he proclaims in the book of John. He says, I love them to the end, and Peter was one of the closest to Jesus. There's no doubt this friendship love that he had for Peter extended to his family as well, and he tenderly touches his mother-in-law's hand, and she is healed. These two people could not have been at polar opposite ends, uh, more polar opposite ends of the spectrum. A Gentile outside the people of God, no formal training about God, and a complete stranger in human terms to Jesus. Of course, Jesus knows him because Jesus is God, but they'd never met in person. He's, he's as distant as he could possibly be. And then there's Peter's mother-in-law, as close as one could possibly be. A descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could not have been more different, but Jesus isn't done yet. That evening, verse 16, they brought to him many, many. No number, no exact number. Many, lots, who were oppressed by demons, and he cast them out. He cast out the spirits with a word, with his words, and healed all who were sick. Now we have demon-possessed people, people who aren't just sick well, like kind of outwardly, physically, but they're sick spiritually. They're dominated by spirits that are not of the Lord. And he heals them and he heals sick people. Before that, we saw the leper last week. Many more are coming in uh, Matthew chapters 8 and 9 who will be healed. And in reality, all these people were likely from all sorts of economically, politically, geographically, and situationally different places. We've seen that. We saw the polar opposites, and there's probably people from every space in between. And not only that, but at least in this passage, there's only one person who, whose faith rose to the point where Jesus publicly commends it. You see, he points out this commendable faith. But even in doing that, he's pointing to something greater. He's pointing to the plan of God. He's pointing to the work of God, the kingdom expansion of, of God. But only one's faith is commended. The reality is they probably had all sorts of different levels of faith. They weren't all like faith heroes. Some of them were like barely hanging on faith. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes display commendable faith. But all the, most, all the more important than the levels of our faith is the object of our faith. All sorts of people are changed in the Gospels, but the change agent never changes. It's always Jesus. I was gonna tell. I was gonna try to tell this story to you that I heard another preacher tell one time, but he'll do it way better than me. If you've ever heard of D. A. Carson, what he's gonna talk about in this video. It's a short video. It's a compelling image, and I want you to just hear him share it instead of me. But it's a compelling image that's rooted in that final night that the Israelites had in Egypt before the Exodus. When that 10th plague comes and the firstborn son is to be slain and God says to them, if you want your firstborn son to live, take the blood of a lamb and put it on the side doorpost and on the top of your door and then the death angel, when he comes tonight, will pass over your home. Listen to D.A. Carson describe this. Picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown, remarkably Jewish names. <laughs> the day before the first Passover, having a little discussion in the land of Goshen, and Smith says to Brown, boy, are you a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? And Brown says, well, God told us what to do through his servant Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the, the lamb and daubed the two doorposts with blood, put blood on the lintel? Haven't you, you done that? You're all ready and packed to go? You're going to eat the, the whole Passover meal with your family? Well, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. <laughs> but 
it's still pretty scary. When you think of all the things that have happened around here recently, you know, flies and river turning to blood, and it's pretty awful. And, and, and now there's a threat of the firstborn being killed, you know? It's all right for you. You got three sons. I've only got one. And I love my Charlie, and, 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 and the angel of death is passing through tonight. You, you, you know? I, I know what, what God says, and I put the blood there, but, but it's pretty scary. I'll be glad when this night is over. And the other one responds, bring it on. I trust the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Which one lost his son? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because death doesn't pass over them on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised. But on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. That's what silences the accuser. The blood silences the accuser of the brothers as he accuses us before God. He silences our consciences when he accuses us directly. How many times do we writhe in agony asking if God can ever love us enough, if God can ever care for us enough after we've done such stupid, sinful, rebellious things, after being Christians for 40 years? What are you going to say? Well, you know, God, I, I tried hard, you know? I did, I did my best. It was, a, it was a bad moment. No, 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 no. I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. There is the ground of all human assurance before God. There is the ground of our faith, not guaranteeing intensity of faith, so fickle are we. It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves. They overcome him on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes display commendable faith. But all the more important than the levels of their faith is the object of their faith. All sorts of people are changed in the Gospels. We met some of them today. But the change agent never changes. The constant throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is Jesus. He's the one who does it. And that was always the plan, that final verse 17 of our passage today. This was to fill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our disease. Matthew's quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. God told us that Jesus would do this through Isaiah 700 years before it ever happened. And now the, the day is here and being described in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 8, God has put on flesh and dwelt among us, come fulfilling Isaiah 53, 4, through the physical healing of people, and not only the physical healing of people, but more importantly, our eternal sickness as well. You see, that prophecy continues in Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came not only to bear the physical infirmities and the demonic possession of the people mentioned in this passage, but to bear our sin to the cross. Not just some of it. All of it. Every thought. Every shameful thing that you've said behind someone's back. Every good thing that you've done with, with selfish motives in your heart. Every single thing. Jesus put it on his back. 
You couldn't have carried it. I couldn't have carried it. And that's okay. That's what it means to be human. But Jesus could. And he does. To the cross. And they put nails into his hands and into his feet. And by his wounds, we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus dies in your place. Jesus dies in my place. And blood spills out of his hands and his feet. And the, the Bible is simple in his explanation that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all our sin. Jesus doesn't stay dead. He's raised to life and power three days later. And he says, now believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe and be saved. If you're not a Christian, trust Jesus today and be saved. And Christians, where are you placing your faith? You might say, duh, Jesus, obviously, I'm a Christian. Well, true. You've placed your faith in Jesus for salvation. But what about today? What or who are you placing your faith in today? Now, no, I didn't ask how strong your faith is. I asked what's the object of your faith. Is it your career? It's not mine, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke about being a pastor, get it? Is it a relationship? Is it finally gaining control of something in your life that seems chaotic? Is, is that what you're putting your faith in? Is it having success in something? Is it, is it finding comfort or adventure or distraction? Where are you placing your faith? Is it a political outcome? Is it providing a good life for your children? On and on we could go. There's a thousand places we could begin to place our faith that isn't Jesus. And some of those things I just talked about are good things. If they find the right place in the order of priority, where are you placing your faith? Is it Jesus? It's the reality that if you are in him, he is with you. And if he is with you, who can be against you? And if he is with you, all the promises of God are yes and amen for you today. Is that the object of your faith? What or who is it that you're placing your faith in? Not how intense, but what is the object? I'll close with this, John 6, 67 through 69. I love this passage. Jesus has taught some really hard stuff, and, and when he finishes teaching it, every body except his closest disciples leave i keep there's this part of me that keeps waiting for that church service to happen everybody's like yeah i don't know about this this church and next sunday i show up and it's just me and josh and the bokels and the earlies maybe some of our deacons show up out of obligation right but the rest of y'all are just like oh we're done with this Jesus turns to his disciples, to the 12, and says, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, no way, this is the best time I've ever had in my life. Jesus, yes, sir, we'll follow you anywhere, right? I guess this is... This isn't some resounding commendation of Jesus. It's more of a what else are we going to do type of faith. Where else are we going to go type of faith. It's not the strongest faith we've ever seen displayed. But it's faith just the same. And the object of the faith is Jesus. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes display commendable faith, but all the more important, beating this horse, beating this drum, is the object of your faith. All sorts of people are changed in the Gospels. All sorts of people in this room have been changed by Jesus, but the change agent never changes. It's always Jesus. Father, today we are helpless, hopeless apart from you. Will you meet us in this space with yourself? 
Might we have renewed faith or renewed direction that you would become the object of our faith again and again and again as we are prone to wander? We sang that today. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Might we today, like the hymn says, here's our hearts, take and seal them. Will you make us have faith in you? Will you make us see you, right? That, that the things of this earth, the other things that would compete to be the objects of our faith would grow strangely dim in the light of Jesus' glory and grace. It's in his name we pray, amen. 60 seconds of silence, then we'll celebrate communion together. As always, I exhort you, don't waste this time. Use it for prayer or reflection, and then we'll close our gathering with communion. Move, move into a time of communion. <clears throat> if you're new with us, we do this weekly as a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. We will pass this out at the front. We have gluten-free here in the middle. And then we'll gather back in our seats and we'll take this communion meal together. Uh, if you're a believer, we invite you to take, a, take this meal with us. If you're not a believer, just observe the body of Christ as we share this meal. Or trust Jesus today and take this meal with us. Uh, but we're going to hand this out first and then we'll come back together and we'll read Mark. Uh, so let's do that now. And as they were eating, he, Jesus, took bread and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And this promise, Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again, of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so we'll do that together one day. Will you stand with me? I want to pray. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this meal, this symbol of your broken body and shed blood for us, your sons and daughters. God, I pray as we leave this place that you'll help us to share our faith in the city, in our neighborhoods, at our work, places that we go. It will be a testimony of your saving grace. Give us boldness to share our faith. We are grateful for all that you've done for us, the promises that you've kept, and the promises that one day you will keep. And we'll be with you forever. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And we'll read this and then we'll be dismissed. Now as you depart, take his yoke upon you and learn from him. And he is gentle and humble of heart that you might find him rest for your souls. For he said, I, will, I give my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Go in peace. You're dismissed. <laughs>